Good morning, good afternoon, no matter where you are in this fine land of ours. No matter what time zone you hail from, we are so pleased, delighted, in fact, that you have taken time out of your schedule to join us today. It's going to be a fun session today, especially if you love the building sciences. And that's what this is all about, how to create your Algonquin College Building Studies education. My name is Daryl Braille. I'm your host tonight. Let me tell you how this is going to work if you've not done this with us before. The format is we promise not to exceed one hour. And we also give the caveat that sometimes when the conversation gets rolling, we may exceed and break that promise. And if that happens, we apologize in advance. The next thing we'll tell you is that the core content where we get through all the main, you know, what you want to know is going to take maybe 40 minutes plus or minus. And, and then we're going to have a live Q&A afterwards. And that's kind of cool when you think about it, because when I say live Q&A, that means you can ask anything you want and address it to whomever you want or not, and we'll ask them. So if you hear something profound, you hear something incredible, you hear something that you don't believe, you don't understand, then we encourage you to please ask a question. That's probably a nice segue to say, well, Daryl, how do I ask that question? Well, it's very straightforward. What you do is you go into your control panel. You probably have that in the upper right-hand corner in front of you. And as you see, you simply go to the section that says questions. Nice and easy. You pop it down there, and we'll get it to our panelists. Now, when the questions come in, we don't ask them immediately. We wait, again, as you already know, to the Q&A time frame. And then, uh, and then it comes up. So, but, uh, but ask them. As soon as you're inspired, ask it. And you are allowed to ask as many as you want. All right? So don't be shy. The next thing is if you want to just share a comment, an anecdote, a story, rather than a question, well, that's okay too. And finally, when this is all said and done, especially if you're watching this on demand, uh, we encourage you to share it with friends, peers, loved ones who may have an interest and may want to know more about this whole program. We do get asked some pretty standard questions on a regular basis, so let me see if I can't preempt them. The first question we get asked is, is this being recorded? Yes. Yes, it's being recorded. I can assure you of that. Next question is, can I get a copy of the slides? Yes. Yes, you can get a copy of the slides. The way that works, I'll make it simple for you, is that you can actually, if you just wait within uh, maybe a week max of this event taking place today, for all those who are attending live, in your inbox, just because you registered, you will get a copy, a link to this recording. And that's great, because then you can watch it as many times as you want to. So that's kind of cool. That's the way it works. My name is Daryl Prale. I mentioned that already. I'm your host. I'm the guy that makes sure we start on time, we end on time, and we have a lot of fun in between. But you didn't come to talk to me. You came to talk to these four experts. So let me see if we can't get to know them just a little bit better. And by the way, I apologize in advance if I mess up anybody's name. It's just, you know, it's just what I do. Maria Para. She is a civil engineer and has a master in science and a PhD in energy and buildings from the School of Mechanical Engineering at Cranfield University, United Kingdom. She has worked at the Office of Energy Efficiency Housing Division, NRCAN, collaborating in the Building Science Technical Group, and has been an instructor at the college for the past six years. She collaborated in the development of the Bachelor of Building Science in consultation with industry and is now a professor and coordinator of the program. Maria, Good welcome evening. to the show. Oh, look at that. She's excited already. That's fantastic. <laughs> All right. Next up, if that isn't enough, then we go to our industry experts. Jeff Armstrong, president of DAC International, has been designing and building energy efficient buildings since his days as a carpenter in the late 1970s. Holder of a Master's of Architecture degree from McGill University, he has been a leading edge designer, builder, and teacher for the past 25 years and since 1999, a trainer for CMHC International. Jeff, welcome to the show. Thank you. Jeff, I can't help but notice your, your bio says the late 70s. You want to be specific. It wasn't early 70s. It was late 70s. It was late 70s. I was four years old. And, uh, <laughs> a bit of a prodigy, actually. That's awesome. We have nothing but prodigies here. Speaking of which, let's meet Jonathan, a graduate of McGill. Jonathan Hamm has worked in the residential consulting industry for over 20 years. He's a certified evaluator and trainer for the Eco Energy Program, certified evaluator for Energy Star for new houses, and quality assurance auditor for all Natural Resource Canada's housing programs. Jonathan has completed over 4,000 energy audits in eastern Ontario. His passion lies with making existing houses more efficient and comfortable to live in. Jonathan, good to have you here. Hey there. All right. 
Last but definitely not least is Stephen Pope, all right? He is an architect concerned with an effective and sustainable built environment. Until recently, a Natural Resources Canada expert in high-performance commercial building, he consults on the design of energy and water-efficient buildings and provides professional development training on building science tools and whole building energy modeling. He facilitates integrated design processes as the vehicle for achieving cost-effective, high-performance facilities. Stephen, good to have you here. It's nice to be here. Okay, let's get this show going. So, Maria, I'm going to throw the baton to you right now. I'll set the stage, you know, just so the whole conversation for tonight. Uh, we're kinda, and we're going to approach this in two ways. Let's, let's start off with first, I want to ask you, kind of talk to us about what is the Building Science Program? How does it work? And then we're done with that. I, I want to bring you back a little bit to, you know, how this all began. But let's start with, you know, what is the Building Science Program? How does it work? Well, this is a four years bachelor degree in building science, and it's a theoretical and applied program. Uh, we teach principles of engineering and construction, as well as modeling. So the idea is to uh, understand building performance, and uh, we have a variety of labs. We will talk about them later. And this came to be because science is taking a larger role in buildings. We need to understand the physics, the chemistry, the mathematics more in terms of heat transfer, uh, moisture transfer, and how everything works together in buildings as systems. Uh, also, we need to keep industry up to date with new materials, especially materials that have uh, evolved to be less or more sensitive to moisture. So uh, there are many things that we need to, to do in order to keep industry up to date. And as I said, this is a four years program. We have two co-op work terms in the program after the fourth and the sixth semester. Now this is a pretty new program, right? It is. Is it like brand spanking new or how far along is we it? We started last fall in September 2000. So we're in our first official year of it right now, exactly, so I would say. Yeah. So these people listening to this session, if you're listening to it in 2014, would be lining up for the second official year. Yeah. That's fantastic. So it's pretty cool. Uh, how's it gone so far in that first year? A lot of growing pains? Been fun? It has been very interesting. We're working also on our lab development specifically for building science. And uh, we're going to have a third and fifth semester of our next next fall. People is really excited. Students uh, from other programs are happy, are interested to join the program, and people from industry as well. So it looks good. Which, you know, and to speak to your point about people from industry, I mean, we have three right here as one example. So they're, they're going to give their perspective on that. So because we know it's a, it's a pretty new program. It's a pretty cool program. It's a degree program, four years, two co-ops. Uh, you've talked to us a little bit about what it's comprised of. But this is what I was alluding to. I wanted to understand, you know, what was the catalyst for this? You know, what was, you know, talk about what was the history of this program that brought us to this point today? Well, we started consulting industry uh, about four years ago uh, we, in meetings, and they, uh, we all brainstormed. We, uh, we looked at 40 programs, Cana uh, Canadian programs on high performance building courses. And we looked at the content, we looked at, at what industry required, what were the things that were not looked at on, during the construction process. And uh, this is the way we started, and it has been just polished, being polishing up more and more as we go. And we finally got approval last uh, this, no, December 2013. So, yeah. And I love this slide. This talks about the, the whole complexity. I mean, there's a lot going on behind this. Science, analytics. I mean, this is not, this is a pretty substantial program. Yes. So um, complexity requires group work. And we know that this is a multidisciplinary industry that uh, requires the collaboration from the different parties. And for that, we also need someone who can overlook the whole process from start to end, and not only through the construction process, but post-occupancy. So all these things uh, are of interest of, for the program. As I said, it's based on science, um, and we need to bring this all this information. We need to gather this information. We need to 
put it back in industry so that we have a standardized, systematized uh, building information uh, for, in general, for the construction industry. So this will be uh, the main points of the program. So, of course, what that means for everybody listening here is that a couple things, right? So you're getting into something that's pretty cool, pretty neat, pretty new. It's going to position you very advantageously in the industry because of its, you know, leading edge design. The other part is because it is so new, because, you know, as, as Maria talks about the history here and, and what it encompasses is that there's been a lot of thought. It's very current thinking. It's, it's, it's right. It's like everything you'd ever want to know about building science right now. Yes, well, um, actually, it's interesting to hear how the definition of building science. Yeah. Uh, there are, mm, you can find different definitions on, on, on different sources, but in, in, a, in a nutshell, it is the study of the physical phenomenon that affect the performance of buildings. Uh, so we need to see how the uh, heat transfers, how air uh, moves how uh, daylight and artificial light balances and how to prevent uh, fire, how to uh, uh, have a good indoor air quality and indoor environmental conditions, comfort inside the building. So all this will be a result of having a building working as a system with all the components uh, working together in an optimized way. Now, when I hear that, that gets me jazzed. That gets me really excited because I guess I hear a couple of things. I hear just a lot of really cool stuff, and I'm not going to be bored because you've got so much variety there. Everything you just said, it wasn't like you're going to do one thing. Like you, you're exposed to everything. You're going to understand how it all works together. But I guess as I, as I graduate from this program, because it is so all-encompassing, I'm going to guess that's going to let me have a lot of opportunities for future careers because I can specialize in a lot of different ways. Exactly. So we have streams in the program, and uh, we have a map. If anybody's interested, I can send them a copy. A map of the program with different streams. Uh, uh, just to give you examples, we have a stream in architecture, a stream in building performance, a stream on uh, uh, construction processes. So all these aspects that we'll look at will give you possibilities for jobs later. We also have building information modeling. And, uh, and that also it's another route. So I yes, it's a generalist program that uh, gives you an or, uh, the tools to be able to work together as a team uh, with the rest of the professionals and uh, gives you the science background required to help solve the problems uh, in the buildings or forecast uh, performance as well. So. So it's theoretical, it's practical, it's everything you need to know. And what I really love about that is that uh, you talked about how you brought industry together to, to help formulate the content in the program. And as we started off the show, and if you're just joining us later, I'll remind you about that, we've actually got three industry experts here with us. And uh, I love the fact that we actually have Jonathan first. Now, reason, I'll, let me explain to you why we have Jonathan first. It's not accidental. Um, Jonathan was sharing with us, and, and he, he said, you know, this didn't used to exist, as you know. We said it's new here. And I had to go through my own journey to kind of get the expertise and, and, and knowledge that is being, you know, provided in this program. And that was the start uh, of, of John this background. I heard he sent over 4,000 energy audits as an example. So this is, he's probably seen it all. He's probably got a story or two. He's smiling as we see it right now. So what we're going to do here is, Jonathan, maybe you can talk to us a little bit about, you know, you've got a wonderful diagram here. Uh, about you know how all these bubbles pop together to, to make you, and then maybe walk us through some of these photos you provided for us, and, and give us some context from your point of view, you know, and, and your expertise. Sure. Um, I uh, when I finished high school, I went straight into McGill University. I went to an environmental science degree at, at McGill, and in the third year, I I read it, uh, an article by uh, Amory Levins about something called a megawatt. A megawatt is a megawatt of energy no longer required because your buildings are more energy efficient. From that, I decided I want to go into residential energy con uh, conservation, uh, more for saving the environment than for anything else. Um, so I went to guidance because we didn't have internet back then. I went to the guidance counselors and said, you know, what should I do? And they said, well, maybe we should do engineering, maybe we can do architecture, but they didn't really have a, a sort of a one solution. 
So I kept on with my course in environmental science. And then after I graduated, I tried to take other courses from other industries and apply them to what I wanted to do. So I did courses at Loyalist College. I went to the University of Minnesota to learn about radon. I went to Natural Resources Canada to learn about the simulation software. Uh, Gonquin College for home inspection and for carpentry for foundations. Uh, Canadian Solar Institute for photovoltaics. Um, I mean, there's a whole list of them there on, on that uh, slide on, that's showing up there. Um, magazines, research, paper, books, conferences, all the rest. And what I didn't realize is that all these things could actually be classified under something called building science. Um, I wish this course had been available back then. Um, it would have saved me a lot of grief. It would have allowed me to start earlier <laughs> um, and uh, get a better basis the, for what um, basically this journey has, has taken me from. So this, uh, I've been, like I said, I've been doing work for about 20 years or over 20 years now in the, in the housing construction. And there's a lot of jobs available and there's a lot of diverse jobs available. Um, some of the pictures up there, the first one's from a smoke, shows a smoke pencil. And what that is, is air leakage testing. There's uh, basically with air leakage, what we're doing is we lower the pressure inside the house. We can find out where the holes are located and give advice on how to seal them up. Um, we want to use, make sure we have building science knowledge so that we don't make mistakes when we're sealing up the, uh, the house. Um, we can also need people to actually do the improvements. So there's a lot of people out there who can uh, insulate and can weather seal, but they may not know the building science about why or why they're doing it, and so you want to make sure you're not causing problems. The second picture is actually from a, a project I was involved with about two years ago with an engineering firm where we were doing building integrity testing on the Algonquin um, Student Services Building. What we did is we had uh, Crane take a guy up on outside the third story window. He hung out there with a smoke generator, uh, generated smoke outside the window, and then we depressurized the inside of the house or inside of the building to find out w if there was air leaking in from the outside. So that kind of uh, work is available. It's called wall integrity testing. There's also, uh, for commercial, there's in-house energy management, and there's something called ESCOs, and you guys can look that up on the internet. Um, the third picture is for infrared thermography, and basically what that's, that's for is it's a, we can use a camera to see energy loss or heat loss in, the, in a structure. We use it for energy audits, for air leakage, and also for quality assurance. Um, I had a job just a couple of weeks ago where someone was insulating a wall or they had their wall insulated, but they wanted to make sure that the wall had been insulated. We got called in to use infrared thermography to actually see if any spots were missing. Building science can be used for home inspections, um, for defect recognition in houses. Um, for problem solving, I mean, we do a lot of that, especially this year with ice dams, um, icicles forming off of roofs. Uh, you shouldn't be have icicles on a roof. Um, but So we would get called in, we'd use building science and inspection techniques to find out what the problems were, or the ice problem, but also how to solve it. Um, so then we also, so that's, there's a lot of jobs available in that. There's also renewable energies. Um, so there's uh, solar photaics, um, solar hot water, solar thermal, uh, microfit if you're in Ontario, and that's using uh, renewable energies to generate money essentially. Jobs are available in design and installation. Uh, then there's new construction. In new construction we have consulting, inspections, testing, also certifications. So uh, things like Energy Star, R2000, Energy Guide for New Houses, LEED, Passive House. These are for people who've built their house. They want third-party testing to make sure it's actually uh, a good house. And so building science will give you that background on, on how to test and how to certify those houses. Uh, the last is energy audits. And energy audits is what I like to do best. It's combining everything. It's combining building science, problem solving, infrared, air leakage testing, computer modeling. And what we do is we show people how they can make their houses more energy efficient, save money, um, be more comfortable. This job, like I said, all those things have actually been done in the 20, past 21 years. Um, I love this job. It's every day is different. We do different work sites every day. I might do air leakage testing today. I might do tomorrow, I might do an energy audit. And then on Friday, I might do a solar site assessment. Um, so it varies, the actual work varies. There's problem solving, using building science to solve people's problems. There's a mixture of office work and field work. The, some people might just want office work or just field work. I have a combination of both. Uh, there's interaction with different clients. Um, 
builders, homeowners, tenants, lawyers occasionally, unfortunately. Um, and uh, there's also <laughs> constant... <laughs> Sorry. Everybody's laughing in the room now, yeah, just so you know. It's, it, because we get called in litigation between builders and, and homeowners or homeowners and, and other people. So anyway, so we get called in for that occasionally as well. But um, there's constant learning. Um, if I could ever learn all there was to do about older houses, um, everything that was done before, which is, may not be a possibility. There's also new products, new technologies, uh, changing theories that are coming out all the time. It's about helping people and also helping the environment, and that's essentially what I, how I got in the job in the first place. So let me see if I can recap for the audience who couldn't see the, uh, the body language taking place <laughs> in the conversation. <clears throat> so our two architects, uh, Stephen and Jeff, were nodding their head with everything about the ice, the ice dam. Um, Stephen was particularly saying you'll never learn everything about old buildings. Um, everybody laughed when we talked about lawyers. And uh, but what I loved about what you had to say there, Jonathan, was a couple things. So first thing, you talked about all the different um, you know, learning you had to do and yes. then all, and all the expertise and all, how, all the jobs, you know, because of that knowledge, you can do all of these. Yes, and there's avail work available for all those things. Um, yes. And that's huge, right? And the, the work is, is, is not drying up. There is tons of work available. No, for and us. so you could, I mean, if you wanted to, you could just do infrared, and there are people who just do infrared or just do home inspections or just do air leakage det uh, detection. I like to dabble, so I do everything. Um, and that's what I was getting to. The second point was you brought in not just the, shall we say, the knowledge aspect, the science, you know. You brought in the interpersonal side. I, I get bored easy. I like the variety. I like to be here today and there tomorrow. You know, I like to interact with people. I like to do this. I like to help. Um, and that's huge. That's just part of the, the program you don't think about that, that is there. And, I mean, I guess I'll go back to you, Maria, now. As you've got your first-year students in this program, are you, seeing, are you seeing more Jonathans in those students where they're just hungry to learn, but they also want to apply and share? Well, yes, actually, the, the, normally the students that are interested in this type of program, they're also interested in the environment. Yep. Uh, I think that's a common theme. Uh, we are still very early in the program to see them too excited about uh, specific jobs they want to do. Yep. Uh, but really, the, the fact that now we have an increasing demand for energy efficiency comfort, uh, structural durability, uh, health in their environment, all that makes you have more possibilities to have a job. That's awesome. And Jonathan, I, I love just how candid you're being. If you like what Jonathan had to say and you have any questions for him, or maybe you had a question for Maria, or maybe John, uh, Stephen or Jeff, who have yet to talk to you, but they're here, trust me, uh, then you can do that and you can ask us questions by simply going to your control panel, to the questions, and putting them there. And, and as they come in, you know, we'll share them to the panelists and I'll ask them in the, the Q&A time frame. So maybe you want to know, you know, uh, more about their experience, their knowledge, how they apply it, what are their career opportunities, what are the salary expectations? These are common questions we get a lot when we do these programs. Um, what are the negatives to this? You know, what do I need to understand? You know, knock yourself out, ask away because this is the product. Next up, as I mentioned, we do have two architects here, one of them being Jeff. Uh, Jeff, if to remind you, is the one, of course, who has been doing this since the late 70s. But <laughs> what I also like about Jeff is that um, Jeff was a carpenter once upon a time. So from both the practical to the design aspect, I mean, you got all facets covered. So you're probably a brilliant individual to talk about some examples of building science. Maybe you can uh, help us out with that. Sure. Um, yeah, I began life, uh, I'm fond of saying, as a carpenter and um, as a teenager, really, when I was in high school. And the more I got involved in construction, the more I realized how much I didn't know and um, became very interested in building design. And I thought, if I'm going to be spending a lot of time uh, creating buildings, I really need to know how they work. And uh, much like Jonathan just described, um, energy conservation seemed to me to be a very worthy uh, area to focus on. Um, I'm old enough to remember the, uh, the, oil, the uh, Arab oil embargo in the, in the 70s, and everybody was lining up for gasoline at gas stations and that sort of thing. <clears throat> and I realized even at an early age how vulnerable we were in terms of energy. So a focus on energy conservation is something that is uh, really a common theme in my, um, in my training and in my work experience. Um, 
so I decided to study architecture. But one thing I realized in a traditional architectural education is that uh, there was very little focus on exactly how buildings worked. It was more a question of um, trying to come up with something that had an innovative look to it, you know, that sort of thing. That seemed to be the focus of, of a classic architectural education. And um, I was much more interested in, as I said, energy conservation. But when you start looking at how to conserve energy, um, you come to realize that, uh, as Maria said, the building really is a system, and conserving energy is only one part of the equation. Um, you've got to make buildings comfortable. You've got to make them healthy to live in. And all of these things are interrelated in sometimes uh, complicated ways. <coughs> so... <clears throat> so um, I, uh, I joined a firm, actually a construction firm, uh, after I completed my architectural training um, that had been committed to energy conservation for a long time. And a lot of what I learned about building science was learned in the field. The photographs on the screen um, indicate uh, where we've, I think, learned the most, and that's in the Arctic. Um, we've done a lot of work in the Arctic in, in recent years. Um, uh, the far north is arguably the best place to learn how buildings perform, how, how they're meant to perform, because the conditions are so extreme. Um, a couple of the other photographs on the screen uh, indicate some research that we're doing with uh, Concordia University. They have an environmental test chamber at Concordia where we're actually testing uh, the performance of new building systems for use in the Arctic. Because in the Arctic, you've got to be very concerned about how moisture passes through the, the skin of the building and how to conserve energy and how to maintain good indoor air quality. So I'm at the place in building science where, <clears throat> to use an overused phrase, the rubber meets the road. We're the people in the field. Uh, we built a business on coming up with innovative solutions to high performance buildings, buildings that are very comfortable and healthy to be in and are very uh, low cost to operate. And a lot of that comes from an understanding of basic building physics. A lot of it comes from uh, just experience working in the field and putting yourself in a position to um, uh, where conditions are very harsh, environmental conditions are very harsh and uh, and uh, you can learn the most in, in that set of conditions. So that's, that's been the way we've, uh, we've gone at it. That's incredible. And I love the, the, in the opportunity because of your expertise and your knowledge, which I'm assuming any building science grad would have the same uh, option, you get to travel to these pretty cool places like the North to actually you know, practice your trade. Yeah, we do. We actually um, uh, were awarded a contract in Antarctica which makes the Arctic look like uh, Miami Beach, actually. Um, the Antarctic, the conditions are, are much more severe uh, than they are in the Arctic. And uh, we have a contract with the National Science Foundation in the United States to develop a, a series of research stations for Antarctica. And uh, this truly is the acid test for building science. That's pretty cool. And what a chance to, to apply your expertise. I mean, that's got to be almost like a... a an ideal uh, toy room for you to go and say, what do we need to do? What can I pull in here to, to apply to this project? Yeah, it's very much like that. All right. So if you've loved what uh, Jeff had to say, don't be shy. Send us questions. You know how to do it in the control panel under questions. But next up is Stephen. And I love your slide here, Stephen, because you also have photos, but you don't have any pretty pictures in these photos. I, I'm thinking you may be trying to tell us something. No, there's definitely a story in the slide, but uh, where we, how we get to these places is always interesting. And for me, um, I'm involved in building science through interest in high performance buildings, and specifically uh, towards the end of the uh, well, the, the end of my time at Natural Resources Canada with uh, net zero energy buildings, and that goes back to uh, my architectural training. Uh, where there's a mandatory mechanical systems course and it's all nonsense. And then there was a passive solar design course, which was actually quite interesting and suddenly laid out the reasons why the mechanical system did what it did and, and the reasons why this worked well. And, and so through that idea, which, which has to 
employ the building as a system concept. The, the performance of the shape of the building and the, and the, the volumes in the building became, became something that you could use to, to make sure people were comfortable and it was properly ventilated. So that, that is, is the beginning as a designer, to have the awareness of building science as a designer then you can be comfortable with a detail for, for sort of an outrageous looking thing because you know how the heat is going to move in it and you know how it's going to respond to air. So you can, you can look at those magazine images and say, well, okay, all we need to do is tweak this little bit over here and, and we've got something that won't result in the contractor having grief from callbacks and, and the architect getting sued. And part of that story is captured in the images on the slide um, we, so we have the two slides mo moving from the left to the middle to the, 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 to the one over top on the, on the right-hand side. We start off with, with an image, which is a subroutine from the, uh, the software that Natural Resources Canada released for the Commercial Building Incentive Program. And that subroutine does a layer-by-layer layer assembly of all the materials in your wall and uh, tells you what the effective thermal resistance of that is. So it takes into account thermal bridging. This is very, very important in other programs like uh, Passive House, where, where the proposal is that the wall never, the interior face of the wall never gets below 17 degrees. So you have to know your building science to make sure that you've got things set up in the right way to accomplish that objective. And another important thing for the building envelope, whether it's commercial or residential, is the performance of the window. And you can, you can buy glass and you can, you can look at the insulating glazing unit that you're going to buy. You can get a specification that says the center of glass is going to perform in this way. But the actual performance of the edge of the window depends on the shape of the window. It depends on what material the window frame is made of. And you have to add all these things together to get the full window performance. So if you move uh, if you change the shape of the window or you, you change the material in the frame or you change the thermal breaks in the frame, you can have a dramatically different performance for the window than, than you might have in effect. Then you take the two, the walls and the windows together, and that's the building envelope. You add the roof, add the, any, any insulated floors, and you look at the whole building's performance. So the last two diagrams, the top diagram is looking at a three-story office building in Ottawa and measuring the impact of the building envelope on peak heating over a year. And the blue line is the 1997 energy code and the red line is the 2011 energy code. And the difference between those two codes is in the 2011 code, the uh, building thermal resistance for the envelope, for the roof and the walls and the windows, was dramatically increased over the old 1997 code. And that produces these opportunities that you can see in the difference between the two curves. And that opportunity holds where you move from heating to whole building energy, which is the slide below it, so that you get a building that, that can run along at its lowest energy setting for longer and, and offers many savings opportunities because the building science in the envelope has been worked out properly you can reduce the size of your heating plant, reduce the size of your cooling plant. You can, you can generate building things that go through the systems that serve the building coming out of these earlier measures with the building envelope. So that, that pulls it all together in a big story that the designer has to be aware of when they, when they start with the, the shape of the building, the percentage of windows, the, the way they want the walls to look from the outside, the, the opportunities they have to to be thermally resistant in the walls. All of that works into the package that ultimately the building operator knows and the building owner knows through the utility bills. And that's the, that's the, the surety that the building science gives you as a designer to, uh, to know that you've done something that not only looks good, but performs well. What I'm amazed, what I'm amazed with listening to the three of these gentlemen talk is we've never left the topic of building science but we've had a lot of variety in how it's being applied, you know, whether it be old buildings, new buildings, buildings in harsh conditions, you know, and those are just some of the examples here. And, uh, and you can see, if you're paying attention, how they have three very different experiences in their careers, whether they be on a daily basis, the problems they're trying to solve, but it all goes back down to building science. That's really cool. Talk about learning a skill and having an amazing amount of opportunity presented to you. 
So let's bring it back to the course now, Maria. Okay, so because everybody here is online, they want to know about the course. They want to know, and, and it's new, but what makes it unique? Well, as we were saying at the beginning, the fact that this is an applied and theoretical program, uh, that makes it very unique. Uh, we have state-of-the-art facilities. Uh, we have the uh, Algonquin College uh, Center for Construction Excellence. It is uh, fitted with a variety of sensors and uh, some cutouts on the walls, on the different elements of the construction. So it's set up to be a living lab. Uh, another fact is our location. We are in Ottawa. We have also a variety of research facilities, uh, governmental uh, buildings that we can visit and we can uh, see what is the research that is being done there. We also have uh, uh, applied research at the college. We recently won the Canada Foundation for Innovation grant for a research project called Enhancing uh, the building industry through analytics and the next generation collaboration, which is very well suited for the building science topics. And uh, we also mentioned we have two, wor two uh, work terms uh, in the program that also makes it very special. And the high graduation rate, that applies to the whole college because yeah. we have a very strong uh, student success support. We, uh, we have uh, applied learning and that works well for a variety of students and uh, in general the groups are very small so we have very good attention to students that's huge then that's a question we get asked a lot when we do these webinars is am i going to be lost in the crowd or do I, am i going to really have some good one-on-one -on -one time to, to, to learn my craft yes for example for this program we have limited 30 spaces uh, for each level, the program might work, might grow, and uh, we'll see. But for now, we, we are trying to keep our class small so we can pay attention to everybody and have uh, a good quality education. So for those of you who have been sending in the questions, how many are you accepting the program? You just heard your answer there, 30. Um, so that's kind of cool. And, and I think I'll make a point here. Um, because I'm not originally from Ottawa, and if you're listening to this and you're not from Ottawa, Maria's made a very compelling point. There is a huge concentration of research organizations and associations and bodies here. So um, if you need to be anywhere for building sciences in Canada, this would be a hotbed to consider. So that's a fantastic point there. Okay, so Maria, you and I both know, and gentlemen, it wasn't too many years ago that you were at school, we'll leave it at that, um, that you can have the world's best program but if the faculty isn't fun or engaging or supportive, then you're going to fail. So talk to me a little bit about uh, the faculty. Well, we, I can tell you we have very passionate professors. And uh, it's probably also, as I was saying, the fact that we are interested in the environment. We are interested in doing what's best for everybody. We want to, to improve our work conditions in the buildings. Uh, and professors are very passionate about their their job and they are uh, most of them are working in industry so uh, that also brings the industry experience and update uh, to the courses and uh, yeah those will be the the industry ties we have uh, we have sometimes also uh, speakers in class and uh, we have probably in the next slide we have uh, we have uh, a series of uh, speakers. We, we are working on this, but we already started last year. We had the Becker seminar uh, in September. We might have another one also in September, and we are working on another seminar for April in building information modeling. Uh, so we try to bring industry to the program. We try to keep that uh, research going on to have uh, industry asking questions and getting students involved in what it's f of interest to them. And also, uh, we have quite a good support on COP, the, the field placements. We have a variety of companies that have uh, also uh, suggested they will support these students getting those placements. 
So I th I think it's a it's a great program. It's a great program. Good opportunities to. So let me let me connect the dots here for some of the students who are listening because this comes up a lot. Um, so first thing is okay. We talked about the program, and you can see the core content is is pretty amazing. Cool. The co-op though is a huge opportunity to practice your craft so that when you're ready for the career, you've got some real world experience already. So that's a huge differentiator, and uh, you get to start to really see what you like. Or maybe you want to specialize in a certain area. So that's critical. But one of the things that people overlook a lot <clears throat> is Maria was talking about the uh, the deep industry ties you see on the slide, the the networking events, the guest speakers. So uh, let me let me paint a point here. I'm going to ask our three industry experts a question. They don't know what I'm asking. They're smiling at me already. <laughs> so, gentlemen, when you're out in the real world <clears throat> and you're doing your jobs, and someone says, "I need a guy who has an expertise in this," or "I need a gal who really knows that." Do you go on that internet thing, or do you go in to your personal Rolodex of people you know, or that you've been referred to by other peers whom you respect? Uh, well, I'll, I'll jump in. This is Jeff. Um, we run a business based in Ottawa, a construction business, essentially, and we maintain very strong ties to Algonquin College, um, specifically because we're always looking for bright and able people to fill our ranks. Um, so uh, we participate in guest speaking and seminars in any way we can because it, it allows us to stay in touch with uh, the people that are coming along. And um, so that type of collaboration works very well both ways. Um, I think it's great for the students, but it's great for us too. It's, it's, it's self-serving in a way on our part, but um, there's a lot to be gained from uh, maintaining those strong ties to industry. And that's the point, right, is right there. You nailed it. Like, you, you couldn't have given a better answer is that um, part of this is preparing you for your career, right? And part of that is knowing, you know, having those connections, having those networking events to try to find that next job opportunity, all right? And whether you're hiring or not, maybe you know somebody who is. So what you're seeing here is a, is a complete turnkey program to prepare you for a successful degree. Speaking of that, let's talk about some degree pathways. So what do we mean by that, Maria, when we talk about degree pathways for those who are not familiar with the vernacular? Well, uh, we have direct entry uh, from high school. So for that, we have some uh, requirements. Uh, we need the uh, Ontario Secondary School Diploma or equivalent with a minimum of six grade 12 university or university college courses, uh, six uh, grade 12, th this, within those six uh, courses, we need to have one English, 12 university course, one math, and one science, 12, both as well, 12 university courses. And uh, the minimum grade for those, it's 70%, although uh, we require an average of 65% in the six grade 12 university courses. Uh, we ha there's also another path to get into the program, which is uh, advanced standing from other courses. For example, from you can see on the slide, uh, from architectural technician or construction engineering technician diplomas. Uh, if uh, you have a GPA of 2.7 or 70 percent, you can join the second year of the program. If, uh, if it's someone who finished the architectural technology diploma or the civil engineering technology diploma, they, ca they can join the third semester if they have 2.7 GPA and at least uh, 560 hours of work experience. And uh, this is just proven through a letter. We just need a letter from the employer. And also people study, uh, finishing their uh, mechanical engineering technology uh, diploma, they can also join in the second year uh, with a requirement of GPA 2.7. So those are the different pathways. Well, we also can have mature students. Uh, they will uh, require grade 12 or OAC English, uh, grade 12 university or OAC mathematics and science with a minimum of 70%. And we also receive uh, international students and people who studied a different career, they can also join the program, but that is analyzed in a case-by-case -case scenario. Fantastic. 
So if you have more questions for Maria, of course, about how this applies to you, the admission process, or are you applicable, send your questions in on the control panel. Go to questions and just type away. We'll get them. But a uh, nice little recap screen here. If you're intrigued by everything you've heard here today and you think this is for me, I want to take the next step. It's very straightforward. Simply go to ontariocolleges.ca. The program code is there. Uh, Maria just talked about the admission requirements, uh, the recap there for you. And, uh, you know, basically, we're going to, when you get a recording of this within the week in your email, you know, in case you're wondering, I don't have a pen, I can't write this down, quick, I need it, it'll be there for you, so not to worry. Uh, but in fact, you're going to see here shortly, we're going to leave up an email address and a phone number you can reach to have any additional information and questions answered. So we got you covered. Uh, we're at the point now that we're fundamentally through the core co content. So what did I say? I said 40 minutes and it was 45 ballpark. So that's not bad. That's actually pretty good. I'm pretty happy with that. Now we're in the Q and A timeframe. And just remind you, if you have your questions, just type away and we'll get them. We'll get them through the panelists. It'll be fantastic. But in the meantime, let's see if, uh, if we have a couple questions here. Um, one of the questions here is for Steven. Uh, Stephen, they, they're asking, is building science all about forensic investigations of failures? That's the really spectacular version of it. That's the, the fun stuff that makes it onto the TV shows and, and these sort of things. Um, as, as we've seen, there's, there's all sorts of applications, and the forensics is one, because you're actually going to a site where somebody's got a problem and they don't know what it is, and you have to help them sort it all out. So you have to know the system, and you have to weave the system for them and explain where things are missing. But uh, my concern has always been more at the very, very beginning when, when the designers are setting up the situation. What are, what are, how, do they, how do they follow it through? What are they expecting to get from what they design? And, and that's, uh, that's, that's the point I'd like to, to emphasize, that, that it all begins with the way someone tries to implement their own idea. Um, question here for Jeff. From the perspective of building science, what is the most common type of problems you've seen? I'd say most of the problems I see are related to air leakage in one form or another. Um, air leakage is related to uh, poor energy performance in buildings. It's related perhaps surprisingly to poor indoor air quality in buildings. It's related to durability problems. It's, it's the single biggest problem. It, it, it um, interferes with the uh, efficient operation of mechanical systems in buildings. Everything seems to come back to air leakage in one way or another. So if a designer, if a designer's done a detail that just can't be sealed by the poor guy on site at minus 40, that's right. there you go. That's right. So... Um, Figuring out ways when the building is in the design process to maintain the continuity of the, the barrier that prevents air leakage, that's, a, that's a, a huge part of the success of a building, being able to do that. Interesting question here, uh, Maria, following up on your description of uh, the program. They're saying, how does it relate to other engineering fields? Do those fields not consider factors that are vital in construction? Well, it... It relates to other fields, for example, mechanical engineering, uh, in, turn in, uh, in principles of heat transfer and thermodynamics, and of course to civil engineering in structures and geotechnical. And uh, uh, from the top of my mind, that those are the ones that I can think of. Um, uh, do these fields do not consider factors that are vital to construction? Yes, they do, but the application is very specific. We, we talked before that the uh, construction industry is multidisciplinary. And so far, we have done a fantastic job in our own fields. And knowledge has burst in almost every field, in, in mechanical, in construction per se, as well with materials, uh, high strength to uh, weight ratio and cost reduction, productivity, building information modeling. So we, we have burst in knowledge in many areas, but no, all this knowledge has to work together. So this, as I was saying at the beginning, this complexity does require group success. We, we need people who is able to walk the, 
through the whole process from the beginning to the end, understanding the language from the different areas in order to transmit and communicate the information and be able to uh, forecast failures and success on time. So all these are aspects that take on engineering and physics and science uh, from different fields. That's a great answer. You know, one of the things that comes to mind is I'm listening to you is I'm, I'm remembering a comment Jeff made earlier in the conversation, which is, in, I'm paraphrasing Jeff, so correct me if I get it wrong, is you were saying, you know, you went to architecture school and, and there was, you were, there seemed to be a focus on the design aspect and what's a neat design. That doesn't mean you didn't learn everything. That just seems, it seems to be where the, maybe the, the natural emphasis was. Yeah, that's right. And, um, just picking up on what Maria said, I think that um, uh, the industry, the construction industry, and the design aspect of the construction industry has tended to operate kind of in silos, you know, where there hasn't been a lot of communication, interdisciplinary communication. And increasingly, um, we're trying to use models that encourage more collaboration. And what becomes very obvious is that there isn't a widespread understanding of, of building science, of basic building physics. So there's a real gap there. And this is what we're talking about. I think people that, um, um, that become enrolled in this program and graduate from this program are going to fill uh, a spot that um, is there in the industry. There's a, a real need for. So um, it's, uh, you know, in, in Pretty well everything I know f about building science did not come from my academic training, and, and that's too bad. And I think that this program offers an opportunity to fix that. I'd, I'd like to pick up on that because there, there's a sense of scale that you learn in real building. And, and when people are working in a silo, um, and I don't mean to pick on mechanical engineers, some of my best friends are mechanical engineers, but, but working in a silo and working on the details of one piece of equipment you might get a 50% improvement on the performance of that piece of equipment, but when you jump scales and go to the whole building, that may be a 50% improvement on a piece of equipment that it covers 10% of your energy load. Mm -hmm. and, and you end up getting trapped in things where people will argue for the benefits of one machine over another because of these things when, when it doesn't matter. And someone who's been exposed to the whole circuit of the building and, and this applies to houses and commercial buildings, can, can say, well, wait a minute, we're making our final decision on the whole package, not, not any one piece. And, and the, this course is, is set up to do that. You'll, you learn things about moisture transfer, but as Jeff said, you'll also learn that, well, actually, there's a lot more moisture that's carried in air that's going through a leak than there is moisture that goes through a building, you know, like a, through a, fall, a solid material. So, so these, these scale decisions are important, and the awareness is going to be a feature of this course. What I, what I love about your answers is it's based on all the years of your experience, right? And especially, again, I go back to Jeff, your point, you know, you have a construction firm. You're doing these innovative projects. So when I hear you say that, that just gives it so much more credibility to me. Uh, and, and I love the point, Stephen, you're getting at about how you can cut up on the little things, but it's getting the whole big picture and having the context to be able to do that. Um, so we have a variety of more questions coming in. We'll keep, keep on sending them, folks. We're going to answer them. That's the, live, uh, that's the beauty of having live questions. They're always fun. Um, but what I, I will point out to you is we're going to leave this slide up here for the remainder of the show. So if you want to follow up, you're encouraged to do that. You can reach out to the, pro the uh, program coordinator, Maria, who's on the air tonight. You can, there's her email address. There's her phone number. Or you can reach out to Glenn McDonald, the faculty marketing officer, and he can equally help you. So both of those people are there for you. But uh, check out Jeff, check out Jonathan, check out Steve, and these guys could be your future employers. You never know. So, you know, it's good to know who they're, they're at. Now, one thing I'll also mention here is, uh, Maria, well, more questions are coming in. There actually is an information session coming up very quickly, is there not? Oh, yes. Uh, next Thursday, we have an information session at the ACE building, the Algonquin College, uh, the Algonquin Center for Construction Excellence. It's at 6 o'clock on March 13th. Uh, we can meet uh, in the atrium. I was going to ask you where to meet. No one ever knows where to meet. And you know where to meet, which is the atrium. So you're doing great. Um, so we have an I another interesting question here. I'm going to come back to you. Um, so the question here is this. Isn't it the job of a building inspector to ensure that a particular building meets things related to the environment, like air quality, energy consumption, safety, et cetera? 
what will be the role of a building science specialist in this context? Does that make sense, the question? Yeah, I think... Um, this is I right up your alley, John. Yeah, well, I just, I think the, the I mean, the building inspector is good for them to know building science, but a lot of them do not. Um, so building inspections, um, you can be doing, basically finding defect recognition, what's, what's the issue, you've got mold on your ceiling. The building scientist is the one who's trying to figure out why. Um, and I think that's the, the main difference. A building scientist wants to know why you have mold on your ceiling. Is it an issue with, with moisture? Is it an issue, is it an issue with, with insulation in the attic? Is it something else? So I think um, that's the main difference between the two. The building scientist is why the building inspector, well, if they don't have the building science aspect to it, it's um, just what's there. Yeah. Building inspector would say, you have mold. Right. Right. And the building scientist says, you have mold because. Exactly. And what's interesting is that, you know, to Stephen's point earlier, a lot of the design considerations take place in advance of what do we need to know to design so that we don't have mold right. in these conditions, et cetera. All right. Uh, another question here. Uh, can a building science specialist apply his or her knowledge on a global scale, or is it more specific to North America? Who wants to jump in? <laughs> Stephen, you're laughing. Good, the good news is physics is the same all across the world. <laughs> Great answer. <laughs> the, the bad news is... Um, Climate is very, very different, even in Canada or parts of Canada. So um, it, you, you get a universal foundation, certainly, um, but then getting the details on why things are actually happening is why so much of this information has really still come out of in-the-field experience. We have a couple of interesting questions here for you, Jonathan. Um, okay. so, what, so you clearly you piqued their interest. First question. What is the weirdest thing you've ever had to diagnose in a house? And, I, and we've got lots of questions here, but I'm bringing the diagnosis one because that's actually the conversation we're just right. having. So what is the weirdest thing you've had to diagnose in a house? The weirdest one. Um, there's been many weird ones. Um, I think uh, I had one which comes to mind because this year we've had a lot of issues with ice damming. Um, so usually the first symptom or things that people see when, when they have, a lot of people have ice on the roof, but they won't have any damage on the inside. Um, the first signs of damage, you start to get a little water pulling on your ceiling, and then it breaks through the drywall and it comes inside. So I had a, a call from a client in the wintertime. They had standing on the ceiling. They were concerned about ice dams. So I went sort of through my checklist, and I went up into the attic to see what kind of insulation was up there. And when I was wa or not walking, I was crawling through the attic, and up ahead of me it looked like something looked like a sheep. And I was like, what the heck is a sheep doing in the attic? It's the best uh, way to insulate an attic, actually. <laughs> um, it turns out the sheep was not a sheep. It was the size of a large sheep, but it was a beehive. Oh, my. And the uh, stains on the ceiling was honey, as far as we could figure oh. out. Um, so when I told them about the sheep in the attic, I was glad I was up there in the wintertime. And they said, yeah, you know what? We, we've always thought that we've had an electrical problem because there's always this buzzing sound in the house. <laughs> Wow. So there you go. So that's something that, a little bit unusual, but um, anyways, that that's probably the weirdest. Probably one the of the weirdest, weirdest things. How quickly did you back out of the attic? Yeah. <laughs> Pretty quick. Well, it was it was winter time, so, yeah, so there was there was no uh, there was no buzzing noise or anything like that. But who, yeah, who was, was the like, one that got to remove that baby? I don't know. Was it, was it you? Right? <laughs> it wasn't me. <laughs> that's no. not part of the that's building right. science uh, that's right. remit. Going back to yeah. that networking question, you had a guy who could help them yeah. out with that. There yeah. you go. All right, another question for you, Jonathan. What is one of the most memorable energy audits you've ever done? Okay, well, um, it depends on memorable. The one with the sheep was definitely memorable. <laughs> um, but we see a lot of cases where um, it may be just a simple thing. Um, I had one just recently where I was called in. Um, people wanted to make the improvements on the house, but the main reason I was called in was because it was a fairly new house, um, house built in, like, the year 2004, but this winter, um, when they, the woman, the homeowner got out of bed in the morning, she had to crunch through ice. The, the, her shag carpet was icy, um, literally ice on the carpet. And so she had to crunch through the ice to get to the bathroom. Not a very comfortable thing. Um, we found it was an issue with the infrared and, and air leakage. We were able to find out what the issue was. Um, but I received an email saying that she's got it fixed and she no longer has ice on the on the on the carpet. This is uh, something we see quite often. Um, we see um, issues 
hopefully you can find what this what the solution is. You can't always. Sometimes it's a design flaw. Um, but to find something to make a difference on on someone's comfort mm-hmm. is is important. Energy savings we see that quite often as well. Um, people making a seventy percent difference on air leakage in their house. Um, we see that quite often. Or insulation differences. It still blows my mind that there's still houses out there that don't have insulation. Mm-hmm. Um, it just it uh, it boggles my mind. But there are so a lot of people who um, who have these huge energy bills and they don't need them. Um, when I was talking to someone uh, recently, and they said, "Yeah, my energy, my my gas bill for the year is six thousand dollars a year," and uh, I said, "Well, that's great. Mine's three hundred bucks." Yeah. Um, but it's, it's nice built to show people that they how they can make a difference and um, reduce that. So this woman who had the the frozen shag carpet, you were able to yes. help her with the frozen yeah. aspect, but. Were you able to help her get rid of the shag carpet? I mean, come no, on. No, I didn't know. get rid of the shag. Okay. No. And I, my apologies <laughs> yeah. to if the yeah. person's listening. Yeah, so there we go. <laughs> I'm All nothing right. against shag carpet. <laughs> uh, Jeff, I got a follow-on question for you. They want to know if does making buildings airtight not make them unhealthy for the people inside? The key to building design, in a nutshell, I think, in, in, in one of its most important aspects, is to make a building airtight and then to ventilate it properly. And if you say, well, wouldn't it just be easier rather than to spend money on mechanical ventilation just to make the building intentionally leaky? And the problem with that idea is how leaky is leaky enough? And even a leaky building on some days is going to have terrible indoor air quality. So as a strategy, it makes a lot more sense to make a building airtight and to ventilate it properly than the occupants in control. They, can, they know where the air is coming from that they're breathing. They can filter it. They can humidify it. They can dehumidify it. They can do all sorts of things to improve the, the quality of the indoor environment. So, uh, indeed, air tightness, uh, you know, it's, uh, what is it? Build tight and ventilate right is uh, the, uh, the standard way of looking at that. Great answer. Maria, they want to know if there's any software such as AutoCAD or otherwise that uh, needs to be learned during their four-year engagement. Yes, we have AutoCAD in the first semester. In the second semester, they continue using a Beam tool, which is Revit, also from Autodesk. And later, they have advanced modeling software, and it's a variety of software that we use there. Uh, another question, sticking with you, Maria, they want to know, it's a, it's a two-part, they want to know uh, what kind of field projects do students do and how much time do students spend in the labs? Okay. So every course, it depends on the course. Every course has its own assigned hours per lab, if applicable. And, uh, and also we have hybrid courses, which, hybrid courses which have uh, online portion as well. So how much time? Uh, I will say probably about 30 to 40% of the course is lab. But consider that we also have research projects and I'm not considering those hours in, in these 30 to 40 percent. And what was the other question? Uh, they wanted to know about the, uh, what kind of field projects do students do and how much time do they spend in the lab? Right. Projects, it depends as well on what is, uh, normally the projects are brought by industry. So if a company is interested in looking at a specific material, its dynamic behavior, we can set up uh, instrumentation and do field in-field measurements. Uh, the research I uh, was talking about earlier will have uh, constructions fitted with instrumentation and f- with sensors, and will be following up performance uh, throughout a period of time. Uh, so it, it, it really depends on the industry. We like to look at uh, energy audits, and there is a course in, in, in that regard. We also have uh, other courses that have material science, for example, that has its own lab for materials. And the projects as well vary depending on what type of project will industry like students to do. That's fantastic. So we actually have uh, a few more questions, and we apologize. We are just plumb out of time. But we will not leave you hanging. We promise you that. And in front of you, just a reminder, you have Maria's email her phone number you can reach out to glenn with his email his phone number and they will answer any questions we didn't get to and anything that you may think of once we hang up and disconnect here so 
uh, we encourage you to reach out. That's what it's all about. I mean, this is, we're not here to, uh, we're here to help you make a good decision that's right for you. And to that effect, we encourage you strongly to join us at the Building Science Information Session this March 13th from 6 to 7.30 p.m. If you want more information on the program, folks, you can uh, see the website address in the upper right-hand corner. As promised, you will get a copy of this presentation within about a week's time. Please watch it again, share it, put it on your Facebook. There's, if you're interested, there's many more out there who are as well. We hope to see you soon, maybe as soon as next year. But in the meantime, thanks for joining us today. We've had a great time. Thanks to all my guest panelists. You've been so forthright and earnest. We appreciate that. And Maria, thank you for bringing this program. This is phenomenal. With that, folks, it's been awesome. Have a great day. Bye-bye.